those of you on the West Coast, good late morning. Uh, my name is Greg Marku. I am one of the uh, assistant directors of admission in the uh, in admissions office. So I want to welcome you all to our presentation about nuclear engineering, um, kind of uh, nuclear at RPI 101. Um, I'm going to hop off in just a little bit. I just want to go over some of the kind of mechanics of the day. Um, I'll post it in the chat now, but if you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the chat. It is a moderated chat, so when you submit a question, it does not automatically populate in the chat window. We're going to answer one question at a time, just to keep it a little less confusing. So if you have any questions, feel free to submit them at any time. If you have any admissions questions, I'll answer those throughout the presentation in the chat, and I will be saving any questions specifically about nuclear engineering at RPI for the end. Um, I have two of my colleagues from uh, the main department, Maine at RPI is Mechanical, Aeronautical, and Nuclear Engineering. Um, we have Kate Stockton, who's one of our uh, student uh, support service people in the, in the main department. And then we have uh, Dr. Ezekiel Blaine, who's one of our faculty members in Nuclear Engineering. So uh, as they get at this point, I will pass it off to uh, Dr. Blaine. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to be going over a brief overview of what the nuclear engineering department is at uh, RPI and what, what you can expect in a career in uh, nuclear engineering and basically what life is like for a nuclear engineer both at RPI and when you go off into the real world. So uh, the presenters for today, myself, I am a uh, professor in the nuclear engineering department. I actually also did my undergraduate and my graduate work at RPI. So I've been here for the past 16 years. So I know both sides of the coin. I know what life is like as a student here going through the curriculum. And then now I'm doing research and teaching here as well. And then uh, Kate Stockton, who is our, part of our department of undergraduate student services. So this is the overview of nuclear engineering that's in our handbook and everything that says nuclear engineering focuses on methods, devices, and systems to get benefits from the peaceful use of nuclear engineer energy and radiation. At Rensselaer, you'll begin with fundamentals in chemistry, physics, mathematics, core engineering, computing, and nuclear phenomena for engineering applications. These will prepare you for further studies in nuclear energy production, energy systems, health physics, and radiation technology. So what does that mean? Uh, so first off, your first few years at RPI, you'll be getting your core basic um, engineering and math and science curriculum. So you'll be learning your calculus, your differential equations, physics, chemistry, all of the core math and science that's necessary in order to do the upper level nuclear engineering courses. And then most of the nuclear engineering curriculum at RPI centers around different aspects of nuclear energy production. So designing and modeling of nuclear reactors, the thermal hydraulics, the heat transfer and water flow in nuclear reactors. We have courses in different radiation applications, how radiation can be applied in the real world in different non-power situations. We also have courses in radiation and the effects on the human body and medical aspects of radiation. And particularly, we also have faculty who are devoted to nuclear materials. So radiation damage to materials, how different materials react to radiation, and similar things like that. And it says here, careers in nuclear engineering include electricity production, food safety, medical diagnostics and treatment, space and underwater propulsion applications, and non-destructive testing. But I would like to go over a little bit some of the careers that students who I either went to school with or worked with um, in the past few years have done as their careers. So very few students will actually go into um, working at nuclear power plants. This is actually not a very common, but it is a possible career for going into nuclear engineering. The probably most common aspect is what we call um, nuclear technologies or the nuclear industry. So these are companies like GE, Westinghouse, and what they do are they design new nuclear reactors. So the design of nuclear reactors, putting new nuclear reactors into new test sites, doing the 
either the power design, the thermal hydraulic design, the materials design. So this is where most of our graduates go. Um, a lot of our graduates also go to grad school, um, probably about maybe um, a third to a half of our graduates will go on to grad school. And in grad school, they will do advanced learning in a specific nuclear field or discipline. And from there, they go into usually either teaching like I'm doing into on what we call nuclear research. So doing fundamental research about whatever their field of expertise is. But these aren't the only possible careers. One of the most interesting ones, I think, is someone that I graduated with decided they, while they were at RPI, they did a lot with medical um, stuff, medical imaging, different medical applications of radiation, and decided for grad school, they were going to go to med school. And they went on to med school and got their MD and are now working as a radiologist in a hospital. So through nuclear, there are a lot of different possible careers that you can go into. So don't just think, I'm going to be a nuclear engineer. I'm, I have to, you know, go work at a power plant when I'm done. Um, another one is we have people who are working with NASA. Now, not necessarily on space propulsion, but on radiation damage. You think when you put something up and into space, there's a lot of neutron radiation, electron radiation, gamma radiation up in space. The spacecraft or the satellite doesn't have the ozone layer to protect it from all of this. So you need to know how different materials are going to interact in that radiation environment. So there's a wide breadth of different places that you can go, different careers that you can have as a nuclear engineer. And this is basically just going over the information that I just talked about. A couple of other, one other interesting thing that um, I want to highlight, I, I haven't known anyone who's gone into it, but I know of it, is art authentication. Now you may think, how do you authenticate art using nuclear processes, but different materials will give off different radiation signatures. So you can tell what time period an art piece or a vase or any type of material was made from based on the radiation signature it gives off. So this is a very interesting and novel um, career path for nuclear engineering. We call it nuclear forensics, where we determine where certain materials came from based on their radiation signatures. So moving on here, this is a nuclear engineering plan of study. So this is what you'll see in the catalog for nuclear engineering. And it gives you your basic year by year account of what courses you should be taking. Um, this plan is a typical plan, but it's not followed specifically all of the time. Certain courses are only taught certain semesters, so you have to try to make sure you have those. But if you're coming in with any AP credits, you have more free electives available. And this is basically a guideline for how you want to go. But there are a lot of different options available to you. And we try to make sure that whatever you come in trying to do, we will help you do that. We have what are called dual majors, where you major in two subjects at the same time. The most common of these with nuclear is mechanical. So you'll have a dual major in nuclear and mechanical. You'll take your core nuclear and your core mechanical classes, and you'll have that possible dual major. If you care a lot about the materials, the material interactions, how to build, like physically build nuclear reactors, this is something that you might be interested in. We've had several people who are interested in the space aspect of nuclear engineering. And we've had people do dual majors in nuclear and aeronautical. So it's a much more difficult major than the mechanical, but it's definitely doable. And students have done that before. Uh, we've had students that have cared a lot about the physics. So understanding the underlying physics of the nuclear program and less the engineering aspect of it. And we've had students who have dual majored in physics 
and nuclear engineering. Physics is even outside the, um, the overview of nuclear engineering. So it's in a different uh, school. So there is less overlap, but it's still doable. We've had students who have done physics and nuclear engineering dual majors before. And let's say you come in and you want to do engineering and economics. That's, that's doable. You can do your major in engineering, minor in economics, whatever you want to do, whatever your desire, whatever you're passionate about, we want to help you achieve that. So you can work with people in the department and particularly uh, the student services office to design the curriculum that will work for you for this. <laughs> you can also decide partway through that you don't want to do it and just stick to one major. I originally came in being like, I am going to dual major in physics and nuclear engineering. I had my whole schedule filled out. I knew exactly what I was going to take every single year. And then I got to physics too and realized I don't like electricity and magnetism. I, I when in high school, I had just done, you know, classical mechanics and things like that in physics, and I really enjoyed those. But I wasn't a fan of this whole electromagnetism thing, so I just became a nuclear engineer. And that's something else that you can do. So it's a very flexible program, and you let us know what you want to do, and we'll try as hard as possible to let you do that. Now, one thing that I want to bring up in particular is the senior year. So if we look at the senior year specifically, you'll see that it doesn't actually have a lot of required courses. So the first course you have is your nuclear engineering senior design project. This is a year long project with a faculty advisor where you and a group of other students will do some sort of design project. It could be designing a nuclear reactor. My senior design project was designing a fusion reactor um, based on certain principles that could be implemented. We've had people design nuclear powered cargo ships. We've had people design experiments to be done at Los Alamos National Laboratory. So you, at the beginning of the year, you'll have a list of different topics by the different professors, and you can form a group and choose one of those topics that you want to spend the year pursuing. And the year gives you enough time to really pursue the topic, to really look into it and design whatever you need to design for that particular project. Now, senior year is also when you have your laboratory courses. So we have two laboratory course, courses, the Nuclear Engineering Laboratory and the LINAC Laboratory. So the Nuclear Engineering Laboratory deals mostly with gamma ray detection. So we have different labs that teach you different uh, aspects of detection of gamma rays, what gamma rays can do, and different aspects in a laboratory setting. You'll be sitting down and actually dealing with the radiation sources and detectors and taking actual live measurements yourself and determining what the outcomes are. And one of the best things about our laboratory courses and why they're placed in the senior year is that these courses experimentally show everything we've been teaching you for the last three years. So we'll tell you in your you know, nuclear instrumentation course that a detector operates this way. And this is the type of signature you should see in the detector. And during that course, you kind of have to take our word for it. You're like, okay, the professor says it and the book says it. So that must be how it goes. But now in your laboratory courses, you can do those experiments firsthand. You have hands-on experience and you can see, oh, when I put this radiation source on the detector, I see this response. So that's one of the main advantages of nuclear engineering at RPI is you have these laboratory experiences. You get to visually see all of the different aspects that you've been taught for the last few years in your courses. And then in the spring semester, you have the LINAC laboratory. LINAC stands for Linear Accelerator. RPI has a 60 MeV electron linear accelerator that we actually designed a course around. I actually was the one who designed this course a few years ago, and this deals with your neutron radiation. 
This is doing experiments at a state-of-the-art experimental facility. This type of accelerator doesn't exist at other universities throughout the US or the world for that matter. Uh, we're currently upgrading our accelerator. Our accelerator is currently one of the top accelerators for this type of work in the United States. We're doing an upgrade now in the next three years. So by the time you're here as juniors and seniors and working with this, it will have upgraded to one of the top facilities in the world for these measurements. And you'll get to use it in this course during your undergraduate. So you'll actually get to perform these measurements with neutrons that are impossible to be done anywhere else in the United States. So the lab courses are one of the best parts of nuclear engineering at RPI. They allow you the hands-on learning that really shows everything that you've learned previously is actually the case. You can now prove, okay, what we were taught works. And for the rest of the senior year, you get to do what you want. It's pretty much whatever you want. You can see you have nuclear engineering technical electives. So these are different aspects. So there are multiple courses available that aren't required for nuclear engineering, but if you want to take that course, you're, it's available. So this is where you start to specialize. Maybe you like thermal hydraulics and want to do, you know, nuclear power systems and how or how the uh, heat transfer and the water flows in nuclear reactors. You can take nuclear electives based on that. If you care about materials and material damages and things like that, you can take those nuclear engineering technical electives. If you really care about the physics behind nuclear engineering or the applications, these are options and you don't have to do what you don't want to do. Let's say you're like me and you don't care that much about the heat transfer in you know, nuclear power plants. You don't have to take any more courses on those. You get to specify which courses you want to take and take those specific courses. And then you can see there are a lot of free electives in your senior year. Your senior year, basically you're front loaded to make sure you know how to do all of the engineering and the physics and the math for all of your courses, your senior year is kind of your year to do what you want and to apply everything you've learned previously in your laboratory courses. And we also have one course available on humanities, arts, and social sciences, which I'll get into those a little bit later on what that means and what type of courses are available there. So overall for nuclear engineering, you have 130 total credits available. 24 of these are humanities and social sciences credits, 32 math and science core credits, uh, 24 core engineering credits, 38 specific nuclear engineering credits, and then 12 credits of free electives. Now, if you're coming in with any transfer credit, any AP credit, this gives you more options. You're usually taking away from your math and science core credits based on what you have, and you have more free electives that you can take whatever you want. So let's talk about each one of the possible uh, electives or each one of these possible class types and what that entails. So Humanities and Social Sciences. So you have to take 24 credits of these courses. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, particularly because I know this is probably the part of the curriculum that you hate the most. If you were like me when you were in high school, you don't want to take another English course again. You don't want to take another history course again. You're done with these. And then you come here and it's like, wait, I have to take humanities and social sciences. I'm going to a tech school. Why do I have to do this? Well, the good news is you don't have to take an English course again. RPI has a wide breadth of different humanities and social sciences courses that count for this. Let's say you like art. You can take art courses, sculpture courses, drawing courses. You can do video editing courses. You can do game development courses. Yes, 
game development counts as a humanities and social sciences course. I took uh, a course on introduction to symbolic logic. So logic and going through different logical trees and everything is a humanities course here. My sister who did um, liberal arts, she was a graphic design major, took logic as her math course. But here at RPI, that, that's a humanities course. You can take that as your, your humanities. Uh, when I did my humanities here, I did courses in philosophy. Now you might think philosophy sounds boring, but the first course I took was called Minds and Machines. And in Minds and Machines, we would watch Star Trek. We would watch The Matrix. And we'd talk about the philosophical parts of those movies. So it's not your typical philosophy 101. We have that as well, but it still has a science and engineering twist to it. I also taught, uh, took a course called Philosophical Problems of Space and Time, where we would spend hours in class discussing different modes of time travel in film and TV and books and how scientifically accurate they may be. And these are just a couple of the possible um, courses that you can take in HNSS, which is Humanities and Social Sciences. So these are actually some of your fun courses. After you've spent, you know, the entire week or, you know, that day in, you know, your, your intense math and science courses, sometimes it's nice to take two hours and just, you know, talk about time travel paradoxes. You know, these, these are your courses where they're not as um, math intensive. They're not as um, science intensive. They're more experimental, exploratory. So you have a lot of different options here in humanities and social sciences. And when I was looking at um, different places to go and I chose RPI, this was one of the main reasons. I was like, wait a second, these are the type of courses I get to take for humanities? I like the sound of this, sign me up. So this is one of the nice things about RPI is this is your humanities. You have to take some humanities. It's good to be well-rounded. And I learned a lot of philosophy concepts in my courses. I learned logic. I decided to take a course in art history because I thought it was fun. And I learned a lot of art history there as well. So it's good to have this well-roundedness, but RPI knows that we're all math science people. We're all scientists, engineers, things like that. So the courses are designed with that in mind. Uh, so moving on from humanities and social sciences, we have the math and science core. Now this is your basic you have to take calculus, differential equations, uh, physics, chemistry. I don't believe we have to take biology. Um, I think it's just physics, chemistry, material science, and mathematics. Um, and this is just so that you have your basic understanding of all of those fundamental principles. And this is really where if you have any transfer credits, AP credits, things like that, you don't have to take those courses a lot of people come with AP Calculus credits. So when I came in, I had AP Calc, AB, and BC, so I started with differential equations, which was fine. I, I knew my calculus, I didn't have to take those. I started in differential equations. And so you, you start in these courses wherever you're at. And you know it's good you know, to have that fundamental understanding. You know the physics, you know the chemistry, you know the math, before you get into one of your engineering or your nuclear courses and you're expected to know it. So this is the basic understanding of materials. Um, yes, you can take biology as a free elective if you like biology, um, which some people do. I was happy to not have to take biology um, when I got here, but it, it's, it's a possibility and the more um, the more credits you come in with, the more free electives you have. Now, moving on to your core engineering courses. So these are a little bit more specialized. So 
the math and the science courses, pretty much everyone in every discipline takes. The science majors take it, the, the math majors take it, the engineering majors take it. Here, these are more specific to engineering. You'll be taking courses on statics, you'll be taking courses on material science, courses on computing and how to solve problems using computers, uh, courses on uncertainty analysis and uncertainty quantification. These are all the courses that you take in core engineering. Now, one of the good things about the core engineering courses is they are the same across all disciplines. Um, I'm currently teaching over the summer the statistics course, so the uncertainty course, and I have students in biomedical engineering, I have students in nuclear engineering, I have students in mechanical engineering, chemical engineering. All of the engineering disciplines take these courses. Now, this is an advantage because sometimes you're going to be coming here and you don't know what you want to do. I honestly didn't know exactly what I wanted to do here. I came in undeclared. Um, and so the core engineering courses give you some time to learn what you like. So it's like, okay, I, 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 like, the, I like the physics. I like the statics. I like this. I, I'm not a huge fan of the material science. I'm not that big in chemistry. And that gives you some guidance on where you want to go, where you want to specialize. So that's one of the reasons we have these common core engineering courses so that you can take your first couple years and really figure out what it is you want to do. Because nothing is worse than spending a year in a major and then deciding you need you you don't like it you want to change your major and having to stay another year because your courses don't transfer over so we have these first it's almost two years of core engineering courses usually by the end of the second year you're or usually in the second year you're starting to specialize but only in one or two courses so you have time to decide what you actually want to do and another thing, particularly with nuclear, is that nuclear has a course called Introduction to Nuclear Engineering. So Introduction to Nuclear Engineering is a one credit course that basically different professors will come in and talk about what they do, their different fields, their different areas of expertise in nuclear and different aspects of nuclear engineering. And that's a very good course to take if you think you might be interested in nuclear engineering, but you're not sure. It's a one credit class, very little work associated with it. It's very easy, but it gives you information. It tells you, okay, is this something I'm interested in? And you can take that in your first year before you need to decide whether you want to do nuclear engineering or not. So this is a way that you have options. You're, you're not like, you don't have to decide now. You don't have to finish this, you know, webinar and be like, okay, I guess I have to choose what nuclear engineering I want to be, or do I want to be aeronautical or maybe chemical? You can, you don't need to decide now. You can take these courses. You can see what you want to do before you have to declare what you're, what you want your major to be. So that's one of the reasons why we have these core engineering courses is so you have time to do that. Now, following that, we have your nuclear engineering courses. So these are the courses that I talked about before. This is your power generation. This is your health physics, medical applications, radiation technologies, fluid flow, heat transfer, all dealing with the nuclear systems. And this is where most of your credits are. So 38 of your credits are in your specific nuclear engineering. But as I showed before, there are your nuclear engineering technical electives. So even in nuclear engineering, you get to decide where you want to steer, what you, what you want to learn, what you want to know. And you'll have basic courses in everything. And then your senior year, you get to specialize. Do you care more about power generation? Do you care more about radiation technologies? So this is really where you get to make your choices. And you can see there that big long picture is a picture of our linear accelerator. So our accelerator is a 60 MeV electron linear accelerator that basically is used to make neutrons. Um, 
So we have a large source of neutrons and we do neutron experiments, neutron scattering experiments, capture experiments, fission experiments. Um, when I go and talk at high schools, which I've done before, I, one of the fun parts of my job is some days I get to, you know, wake up and just throw a hunk of uranium in the beam and see what happens. I mean, granted, I mostly know what happens, but I get to work with uranium. I get to work with plutonium. I've worked with plutonium out as, at Los Alamos doing work out there, and it's fun. It really is. To do experimental work is a lot of fun um, for anyone who hasn't done it before, and you get to really see what's happening. You all, Because nuclear is a lot of concepts. Nuclear, you, you can't visually see this like building a bridge. You know, when you're building a bridge, you can see what happens. You can see when it breaks. It's harder to see that in nuclear. But through our laboratory courses and our research, you can see what's going on. And it's one of what I, I love waking up and, you know, going to the lab and doing the research and, and finding out these new things that we didn't necessarily know before. So there's a lot of fun in that as well. So lastly, after our nuclear engineering courses, you have your free electives. Um, so the free electives is where you get to do literally whatever you want. Um, if you want to have a minor in economics with HNSS and your free electives, you can do that. Um, if you want to do a dual major, the dual majors basically take up some of your free electives, most of your free electives, but it's doable. You want to be dual, you know, mechanical and nuclear or aero and nuclear, that's perfectly fine. Um, another interesting thing that we have here is what is called the undergraduate research program. So you can start doing research with some of the professors that you're taking classes from. You want to do research up at the accelerator? That's an option. We've had students do it before. I started doing research at the accelerator when I was a sophomore. And from sophomore, junior, senior year, I did research there every semester and every summer. I just love doing it. And it's not just the accelerator. We have material science labs. We have thermal hydraulics labs that you can be a part of, that you can do research there. So find what you're passionate about and talk to the professor and ask them, do they have openings for research? And most of the time they will. So you can do research as an undergraduate, which is another thing that you don't get at every university. You know, our undergraduates do a lot of our research. Our undergraduates are on papers. You know, we write papers with our undergraduates and they do a lot of really good work here. Um, so that's another advantage of coming here at RPI in the nuclear engineering program is you get to have this opportunity to do research even as an undergraduate. And some people will find they don't like research. Um, some of the people I've worked with, some friends I had that did undergraduate research, they decided that wasn't for them. Um, when I started out doing undergraduate research my freshman year, I was doing computer coding. Um, I was doing computer simulations and different aspects like that. And I decided that's not for me. Let me try this experimental branch of research. And that's what I liked. And that's what I kept doing and why I've been here for the last 16 years. So it really, the undergraduate research program gives you a chance to try out things. You can try out this type of research. You can see if you like it before committing to it or committing to grad school. If you're interested in grad school and doing research in grad school, the undergraduate research program is a great way to start. You're like, okay, this is similar to what I'll be doing in grad school. Do I like it? A a am I enjoying this? And that program gives us the option. So that's another thing you can do with your free electives. Or if you don't want to do it as a free elective, if you have extra time, you can actually get paid for it. I did it for pay every single semester I was here. It's not a lot, but it's a little bit of extra money, which is always nice and something I want to do anyway. So this is another thing where you have your free electives where you get to choose what you want to do. And then there's learning outside of the classroom. So we have a lot of different professional societies, different clubs available. 
Um, and there are a lot of options for co-ops and internships, particularly in nuclear engineering. Um, we've had a lot of students go to either the nuclear utilities or to national labs. We have a lot of contacts at almost all of the national laboratories and our students can go there and do research at a national lab. We've had several students go out to Los Alamos. We've had some students go down to Brookhaven, some go to Argonne, Sandia, Oak Ridge, um, pretty much any national lab you want to go to. We have contacts there and we can work and get you into those programs. So we can find you people to work with there. So this is kind of outside of the classroom. It's like, okay, during your summers or your um, semester semester off, um, you can go to these places. You can do a hands-on learning or hands-on job experience. You can go to the utility, see if that's what you're interested in. So there are a lot of options available in nuclear engineering for different co-ops, internships, and things like that. Now, the last thing I want to talk about here is one of the highlights of our department as a whole, which is our student advising. Uh, we have excellent student advising and the people working at both the engineering hub, which is the first year advising hub, as well as our Office of Undergraduate Student Services are always there to help you. And they will help you with whatever you have an issue with. If you have an issue dealing with a professor, if you're interested in research and don't know who to talk to, if you don't know what courses you should be taking, the, the people at these locations, at these departments are always there. They're always willing to help you. And they've been helping people for a very, very long time. They, they know what they're doing. They know who to talk to. If you're having issues with the registrar, with the bursar, they, they know who to contact. Because sometimes who to contact isn't who it says to contact. They, they know the people who will make sure that everything gets done for you. Um, and they're, they're amazingly helpful. And this is something you won't necessarily find at all colleges. Um, the, these, the, the people in these um, departments are there to help you. And they are very good at what they do. They're very good at their job. And this is one of the highlights of our department is both of these locations and their, their help with everything. Um, and that will do it for the, um, the overview part of this. And if you have any questions, I am happy to answer them. That was great. I learned a lot, thank you. So any questions, send them through. Um, the other thing I just wanted to kind of touch on with that last slide is that students also get a faculty advisor in addition to having both the student um, advising hub and um, our office, the main student services office. Um, the faculty advisors uh, help the students kind of talk about their specific field. So um, you kind of have the best of both worlds. You got people who can help you that know the real ins and outs of nuclear. And then you also have us that know kind of the nitty gritty ins and outs of RPI and, and all of that. I think, um, okay. So I think, um, you want to jump on and start these kinds of questions? Yeah. Yeah, there's one, we have one question right now is, what are you looking for in applicants? I think it's a great question. Um, we'll talk, you know, I can talk generally because we do read applications not as, you know, a nuclear engineering application is different than a business application, is different than a humanities application. They're all going to be looked at the exact same way. So, when, uh, you know, so we're, when we're looking at an application, we want to see strong grades, A's, B plus types of averages. We don't calculate a GPA. We don't, if your school does have a GPA, we will take note of it, but what we're really looking at are your grades. So strong grades, we want to see biology, chemistry, and physics. We want to see those three core sciences. We want to see uh, four years of math up uh, until at least pre-calculus, preferably calculus for some of our more competitive programs, some of the school of engineering programs, things like that. 
Um, we are test optional this year, um, so you don't have to tend, send your test scores if you do not want to. Um, we're piloting it this year, so if you're a senior, you, we are test optional when you're applying this year. If you're a rising junior, we're going to reassess after this application cycle, and we'll make that news uh, public whenever we make whatever decision we make as soon as possible. So you don't have to send your test scores in. If you want to, again, you can. Um, we want to see strong recommendation letter. We only require one, uh, but you can send more. I ask for no more than three to four at the most. Uh, any more than that, they all start to blend together. And uh, we really want to see unique aspects uh, of who you are if you're going to send multiple recommendation letters. We want to see someone who's well involved. Um, extracurricular activities, leadership experience, things like that. And then a, a well-written essay. Um, and I always say, you know, when we're, write, when we're reading an essay, it's not the topic you're writing about, um, it's but it's how you're writing about that topic. I've read great essays about everything, and I've read terrible essays about everything. So uh, it's really about making, you know, if even if you think you have a, a, a boring story that, that you're like, I don't know what I'm going to write about, you can make something very interesting. I read a great essay last year about how the student just loved to dance by himself in his basement. And it like, I was like moved afterwards. Um, so uh, not physically like he was, but emotionally. So it's, it's, again, you can write, this, you know, a, a great essay about everything. Um, so we're looking at, we do a holistic review, um, not necessarily anything in particular. Um, what does admissions look at? Two years of foreign language and, and then computer science. So we're actually, uh, relatively unique. Um, we actually do not require a foreign language for admission. Um, it's not something we're looking at when we're reviewing your transcript. I know many other schools are. So again, if you're a junior or a rising senior and you're like, I don't want to take my third year of Spanish, make sure when you're looking at the schools you're thinking about applying to that they don't need that third or fourth year of a foreign language. Again, we don't, but there are many schools that do. Um, you know, not only you know, in our area, but also throughout the country. So definitely keep an eye on those types of things when you're thinking about that foreign language. Um, kind of when you're talking about computer science, we don't have a preference if you take any particular engineering courses or computer science courses um, beyond, again, those, those three main sciences, biology, chemistry, and physics, and then the up through pre-calculus for math. Um, besides that, we don't have any core, you know, classes that we require. So don't feel like you have to have any engineering knowledge coming in. It will help you, but it, you know, when it comes to starting at RPI and you'll have a little bit of an advantage when it comes to the things that you may know already, but it's not going to affect you in an admission standpoint. Not all schools have those yeah, types of programs. Yeah, and I just want to um, so add one you know, thing on judge that, someone for having where one of your core programs. engineering courses is a computer programming course. So don't feel like if you, you know, didn't take this in high school or anything that you're going to be behind. We want to make sure that everyone's on the same footing with, you know, computer programming and things like that. So we have a specific course that all students will take doing computer programming. So it, it, don't be worried if you don't have any, um, any experience in programming before you come here, you'll get that here. Exactly. Yeah. Our, our, we always say, you know, it's our job to teach you the skills you're going to need for your career in your program. So we don't expect you to come in with that knowledge. If you have any programming knowledge, that Comp Sci 1 course will be a little bit easier um, than it may have been previously, but we're going to teach you all the needed skills. Um, this is one for, for you guys working at national um, laboratories. We, with we Mexican, have connections at some international laboratories. laboratories. That um, I can only speak uh, specifically for nuclear we have contacts at the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Association. We have contacts at the um, Cataract Laboratory, which does um, stuff in France. Uh, we have contacts at um, the Gale Accelerator in Belgium, uh, contacts at the Carey Institute in Korea. Um, I don't believe we have any nuclear engineering contacts at CERN right now, but we do have people that we know at different international laboratories. And those are options. I think one person did actually uh, go to the IAEA um, for an internship at one point. So that, that is something that's available. And any, any place you, you want to go that we don't already have an established contact with, we could work with you on getting one. Because even if it's not somebody that we know very well and have, you know, 
research relations with, we know of them. We, we've seen them at conferences. So if it's someplace you're interested in going, we can work with you and let you know who to contact, who's doing what type of research and different things like that. Awesome. Um, all right, we're going to do this one next. Professor Blaine, um, what about uh, the RPA nuclear engineering program in your undergrad yeah. years made you want to stay and get your doctorate at the same at RPI? I think it's a great question because yep. you've, I've been you've here been, for 16 I you, years. I don't know if you said that. Um, so it, but I think you said honestly, 16 continuous personally years for me, RPI. the undergraduate research program, um, I started doing research up at the accelerator uh when I was a sophomore, I loved doing it. I worked with different graduate students um, through my years. By the time I was a senior, I was given my own project. So I wasn't even working with a graduate student. I was doing my own research and working on things like that. And it's funny because um, in, I believe your junior year, um, you take a professional development course where one of the parts of the professional development course is um, how to do interviews, which is a very important skill. And you know, you go through your interviews and you know how they would go and what's called a 60 second sell, where you have to sell yourself to someone in 60 seconds and they do mock interviews and it's very useful. I ended up taking that course in my senior year and I was going through all of these different, um, you know, how to do interviews and everything a couple weeks after, I was sitting down with my advisor and he was like, hey, do you want to come here for grad school? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, OK, cool. And that that was my interview for grad school. So um, so the, the, the research opportunities here were really uh, what set what set it apart and what made me want to stay here, um, particularly for me, the the uh, linear accelerator. You, you won't be able to work at a facility like that at any other university. Um, so for me, that, that was the draw that made me want to stay here, but it was being able to do the undergraduate research here in general that made me want to go to grad school. Yeah, and, and we do have within Maine, um, it's a program that was in the School of Science, but it's, it's just moved to Maine, um, is an accelerated PhD program as well. Um, so you can start that program and you basically just start your grad research early, um, usually your senior year, um, like right. Professor we, Blaine we did. Have, um, just and just one thing on that, we have several students a little bit faster. Um, in, um, in, I have my, one question um, in my group, um, in my research group who have done that accelerated PhD. Most of them actually did research with us and then decided they liked it. And was like, okay, might as well, you know, start your PhD early then. Start doing research early, um, which you don't have to do, but it's an option if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. I have one more question. Again, keep the questions coming. We have the three of us have no time limits after this. So if you want to stay here and ask questions for a little bit longer, feel free. Um, this one is always an interesting one. And we get it probably at every single um, webinar or session we do. And, and why? Uh, what would you say is the biggest difference between RPI and WPI? Um, and we kind of get RPI and blank school. Um, we get those a lot. The uh, example, the, the, the thing I always say is we're in Troy and there in Worcester. Uh, that's the the biggest one, and it's the the first initial of the acronym. Those are the you know those are the big differences. Both have great programs. Um, if you if you talk to some of our faculty, they are going to have uh, their own opinions and things like that. I mean, we have faculty that uh, at, at WPI that are RPI alums. We have faculty um, at RPI that are RPI alums. So it really is. Um, well, for both this have their um, webinar really in particular, WPI does not have a nuclear engineer. Just say anything on that. So if you're interested in nuclear engineering, I would not recommend going to WPI. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good answer, yeah. Yeah, and the, the one thing I hear yeah. sometimes about WPI versus RPI is that they may be a little bit more hands-on with some of their classes. We definitely have the, the hands-on experiences. We have a lot of lab classes, but, um, there's also a lot of analytical work that students do at RPI versus at necessarily something like WPI. So it's really good for students to really learn like what is 
what is the experience that you want to have? And students that want that hands-on, but also want the analytical, the analytical work kind of leads more to that further education route. Um, they can still get those experiences in our student clubs and, you know, they can kind of practice all those skills in different ways um, and still get an experience like that and that students get at WPI. Yeah, and I think that's a great point is the one thing we hear from employers when uh, our graduates go there and they work is it is the strength of their critical thinking and, and analytical skills uh, really sets them apart. So, you know, when they're 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 always the kind of the critical, not only the critical thinkers, but the, the go getters and the ones like, all right, here's the problem. Let's figure something out for it. So that's really kind of what makes the RPI education a little bit more specific and unique. Um, I not seeing any more questions. If you have any more questions, feel free to send them through. Um, I'm going to put my contact information or my email address in um, in the chat so that if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me. Um, and, and if it's something particular about nuclear engineering, I can reach out to, to Kate and, and Professor Blaine and get those answers for you. Um, or if you have any questions, um, for admissions, I can answer those as well, obviously. So um, if you have, and Kate just put her, her email in. Um, so feel free to ask us any questions if I'm you get real comfortable uh, asking them over well. the session here. So if you have any questions for me, feel free to contact me, anything about the new engineering program, the classes, research, anything like that. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, it is. You can now probably see his the the name on the video is misspelled because the his email has Blaine E in it. Uh, so it's how the RPI email system decides to do our email. So um, if you, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in, um, so I'll, I'll end the webinar here. Uh, and now um, again, thank you, thank you uh, to Professor Blaine, thank you Kate um, for helping us out here, uh, getting this great information about the nuclear engineering program at RPI out to these students. All right. Uh, everyone have everyone have a good afternoon and stay safe.